What I'm going to present to you today is work done by a, a group of us and a gender unit, Life Second Fish, across the different value chain countries. So the title goes Gender Capacity Assessment and Development in Four Life Second Fish Value Chain Countries, and these are Ethiopia, Tanzania, Nicaragua, and Uganda. Uh, in this presentation, uh, we shall be going through the importance or advantages of conducting a gender capacity assessment. Uh, we shall walk through the framework that we used to assess gender capacities of our partners, and the level of analysis, the tools we use, and then uh, I'll share with you our experience from using this methodology, some of the key findings, conclusions, and what we plan to do after that. So why gender capacity are you doing it? <laughs> okay. Why gender capacity assessment? Um, as we all know, it's one of the components under the capacity development unit, but also under life second fish gender strategy, capacity development is one of our key outputs. And we endeavor so much to develop the capacities of the partners we work with, but also our staff, I should say, to ensure that we all work towards the gender equality goal, one of our mandates as either. <laughs> So we do this gender capacity assessment of our partners to ensure that uh, we identify the gaps and these are gender capacity gaps in our programs, in organizations. And through this gender capacity assessment, you're able to uh, capture information that provides a starting point for working on a gender capacity development strategy. And this strategy, of course, is informed by the gaps that we have identified. And through conducting gender capacity assessment, you're able to identify opportunities to invest your resources. And we talk, when we talk about resources, it's not only financial resources. To be able to, evolve, to develop the capacities of an organization, we need the human resource. People who be implemented the, implementing the gender-related activities in an organization to help you develop, the, um, I mean to help you implement the interventions that will lead to gender equity. In addition to that, uh, we also argue that um, conducting a gender capacity assessment helps you identify some of the partners that you can work with to strengthen the gender initiative in your organization. And this assessment also establishes the baseline and indicators that you can use to monitor progress towards gender capacity development of your staff. And these pictures basically show some of the activities that we've done so far using our methodology. So for us to be able to identify the gender gaps in our organizations, come up with some of the indicators to monitor, to be able to identify who to work with to deliver on the gender equality goal, we need a more systematic and comprehensive tool to capture that information that we can use. Last year we had a tool, but it was a very basic tool to help us assess the capacities of our partners. And early this year, we noted that actually that tool did not capture so much in the information to help us come up with a more rigorous intervention. So early this year, Elyri um, commissioned a team of consultants from Transition International to work closely with the gender team in the Life Second Fish Research Program. And we work closely to develop a more comprehensive and systematic tool and methodology to help us assess the gender capacities of our partners. And what this tool basically does, it helps you identify the current levels of capacities, which you measure against the desired levels. And it's a three-dimensional framework that we basically drill on. And this framework, first of all, it assesses the core called gender capacities, and these are the capacities that uh, we thought were very key for an organization or an individual to be able to deliver on the gender mandate. And there are three levels of analysis, which I'll walk through later on, and um, we have key partners whose capacities we mostly assess, including development partners, and those are the partners who adapt or adopt our, our technologies and bring them to scale. And we also have our national research partners with whom we collaborate in coming up with appropriate technologies. 
So going back to the core gender capacities, what do we need to do as uh, either staff or partners to be able to integrate gender in our work to close the gender gap in agriculture? One of the core capacities is gender analysis and strategic planning. So what do we assess here? Here we look at the capacity of our partners to conduct gender analysis. And when we talk about gender analysis, we are looking at the capacities to look or analyze the relationships between men and women, the power differences between men and women. And here you can ask questions such as who does what? Who makes decisions on what? Who owns what? But based on a systematic definition of uh, the gender relations they're trying to tease out. And it's not all about analyzing the gender relations or the relations between men and women, but it's about the capacity to also use this information to inform your next interventions. You don't keep the results on your shelves, but you're supposed to use these results to inform our next interventions that will directly benefit both men and women that we work with. The next core gender capacity is effective partnerships and advocacy on promoting gender equity. And what do we mean by this? We don't work alone, we work with partners. And if at all we are to maximize impact, we need different partners who can help us deliver on this mandate. So here we assess the capacity to identify partners. And not any partner, but partners with the skills or the resources to deliver on the gender mandate. And that is the capacity to analyze gender, but also the capacity to ensure that the interventions will increase men and women's access to and control of resources. Then advocacy, uh, do these partners have the capacity or the materials that help them advocate for gender equity or influence government to integrate gender in the policies to ensure that both men and women benefit directly from the interventions in place. Then the other core gender capacities is um, gender responsive programming, budgeting and implementing. And here we look at the gender responsiveness of the different interventions that uh, different organizations have in place. To what extent are they gender responsive? And when we talk about gender responsiveness, are they addressing the interests or the needs of men and women? And are there resources, for example, budgets specifically allocated to gender-related interventions? Then the other core capacity is knowledge management and gender-responsive M and E. M and E. And here we look at the capacity to collect sex disaggregated data, use this data, analyze it, and use it to inform your interventions, but also monitor the impact of your interventions on both men and women. There could be positive or negative impacts. But do you have the capacity to do that, to collect this data and monitor your interventions and report on the gendered impacts? And gender and leadership, here we look at the capacity, for example, of the leadership or the leaders in the organization to guide the team, guide the staff to deliver on your vision. And this is the gender equality vision. Do the leaders have the capacity to do that? How about the commitment to gender equity? The commitment to hire women to ensure that there is equity within an organization, your gender balance within the organization. And the last core gender capacity that we look at is innovation in gender responsive approaches. And these are basically approaches that we use to increase women's access to and control resources. And these are approaches that also help us transform some of the constraining norms that hinder women's access to and control resources. So those are the key core capacities that we assess. And these are capacities that we think that an organization or at least an individual should be able to have or should have to be able to deliver on the gender equity goal. So we do this assessment on, this is the next slide. 
Uh, this next slide basically presents the different levels of analysis. We do not look at individuals alone, but look at the organization as a whole, and also the environment around us. When you're looking at the individuals who assess the skills, the knowledge, and their motivation to integrate gender in their work. And individuals work for organizations, of course, but within the organization, how do the internal policies, procedures, or arrangements enable individuals or hinder them to deliver on their mandate? How about the enabling environment, which is kind of beyond us, at national level? How do the policies in place or regulations enable us or enable an institution to deliver on the gender equality goal? So those are the levels of analysis that we normally do analysis on. Now using the methodology that we developed together with Transition International, we're able to carry out assessments in four value chain countries, Ethiopia being one of them, Tanzania, Nicaragua, and Uganda, as mentioned before. And in total, we assessed 24 development partners and research partners. And these are partners that were strategically selected based on their commitment to gender within the value chain, but also the active involvement in the value chain. And the details of these uh, can be found in uh, our reports, who we really assessed in the different countries. Now, how is this methodology structured? We use the, the framework that I mentioned to you before, but for us to capture detailed information that will enhance analysis at the different levels, we use three tools. One of them, I would call them tools or methodology. One of them is a focus group discussion. And this is basically the starting point when we're trying to understand the capacities within an organization. And here, to be able to conduct a focus group discussion that will give you rich information, that will give information that will help you clearly understand the capacities within, within an organization and the opportunities or constraints within the organization. We invite staff, and this could be at different levels, middle or high level staff, but to select them strategically to ensure that all the members present can air out their views freely. So it's normally a maximum of about, let's say eight people, and it's a guided focus group discussion using a checklist which has systematic questions. And normally it's facilitated by a gender expert who really has a clear understanding of gender issues in an organization. And as you walk through this tool, partners normally assess their capacities and give themselves scores based on how they think their capacities are developed at organizational level. Now, after the focus group discussion, we select individuals, or normally, it depends on, the, on, on how big the, the focus group discussion is, but individuals further assess their capacities. And these are the capacities that we talked about before in the framework, the key core capacities. And we have forms to do that. We have the Google Forms. This can be done online. But uh, the forms can also be printed out and have partners fill out the hard copies. But researchers need to fill out this information online to be able to analyze the data. Then we have the key format interviews, and basically these key formats give us information on a broader perspective at national level. And these key formats also have to be strategically selected because you want people who give you thorough information about uh, the enabling environment, the, the policies in place, okay, and how these are helping different organizations or staff to integrate gender in their work. 
And as I said before, when we are assessing the capacities, there is a scale, one to five. One being the least, and five being the highest. And when you score five, it means your gender capacity is fully developed. And normal capacity development is actually needed. You're good to go. And this next slide gives you kind of a snapshot of uh, the sheet. It's an Excel sheet that we use to key in the scores. Each core gender capacity has different parameters that uh, partners normally discuss and gauge themselves. So on my extreme, is it extreme? left. We have the parameters, as you see, A1, A2.1, that's a parameter that will help us assess the organization's capacity to conduct gender analysis and plan strategically. The middle column is, the score, is where we record our scores, and the last column is where we document the discussion. It's very important to capture the qualitative data, and these are the discussions that go on as partners assess their capacities. You can't rely on the scores alone because they may not tell you much, but what is behind that score is what you really need to be able to come up with um, good indicators, but also areas where you'll intervene. So what are some of the key results from conducting gender capacity assessments of our partners in the four value chain countries? As I said, we did the assessment at the environmental level, in video, and organizational level. So from that assessment, we noticed that uh, the governments of Nicaragua and Ethiopia have relatively well-developed gender policies. And these are policies that basically guide the nation as a whole, but also the institutions to implement interventions that increase men and women's access to resources, but also ensure that uh, women who are disempowered are empowered to improve their livelihoods by accessing better opportunities available at national level. And we also noticed that um, with this good enabling environment, with good policies, the partners in Nicaragua scored kind of highest, I should say. They had better developed capacities compared to the partners in the three countries, Tanzania, Uganda, and Ethiopia. And of all the four countries, we noticed that partners in Ethiopia had kind of uh, the least developed capacities. We also noticed that um, development partners scored relatively higher on all the core capacities compared to the research partners. It was kind of um, a striking finding, which we didn't expect, but actually it is. Development partners, we thought, had better developed capacities because they are more exposed to other organizations, to work with other organizations that uh, deliver the gender mandate. So in one or another, their skills are enhanced by working with these other NGOs. Then we also noticed that um, there was kind of interest, high interest and commitment to support, support gender and leadership. And this kind of scored higher. And this is not the actual capacity of the leadership team to guide staff to deliver on the gender mandate. But it was just the, the, having the commitment to ensure that there is maybe gender equity within a, an organization, but not the actual capacity to lead and guide staff to deliver on that vision. And then what scored least was the capacity to apply or implement gender innovative, I only to understand innovative approaches. And these are approaches that aim at uh, transforming the norms 
or attitudes that constrain women from accessing and controlling resources. So this graph basically highlights the overall kind of level of capacities that we have amongst all the partners that uh, we assess in the four value chain countries. And here, of course, you see Ethiopia with the gray bar scoring a bit lower, and Uganda, but Nicaragua really stands out clearly that their capacities were more developed. And uh, drawing uh, from the case of Ethiopia, to just give you kind of a more detailed analysis of um, how we scored, how partners scored against all the other capacities, we noticed that um, at organizational level, of course, the development partners score slightly higher compared to the national research partners. And at individual level, we also noticed that uh, the individual capacities were slightly higher compared to the organizational capacities. And I will not go without saying that uh, if I told you dig deeper into the analysis, you notice that uh, different organizations score differently on all these capacities. These are kind of generalized, but when you look at how different organizations score in the different countries, you come up with different, different results. Some are strong in one area, others are weak in another area, and that helps you target your interventions. So in conclusion, within and between partners in the four countries, we notice that uh, there are differences in their capacities, in that you can't really come up with a one-size-fits-all intervention. You need to understand where the weaknesses are for a particular partners, and then develop tailor-made intervention to suit the needs of that partner. And because the conditions also vary across all the countries, we argue that actually there should be partner-specific recommendations. And overall development partners, of course, scored slightly higher. And we need supportive institutions to help us really deliver on this mandate to be able to narrow the gender inequalities in agriculture. And these are basically, when we talk about institution, institutions, we're looking at the policies in place, the regulations, but also the procedures within organizations and the commitment of our leaders to gender equity. And uh, what's our way forward after conducting this assessment? We plan to share our results with our partners, particularly those who participated in, the, in this assessment. Tanzania has already shared the results with the partners. They've went ahead to further prioritize their intervention areas, the capacity that they thought were really very, very important to them to develop at this critical moment. And we're yet to do that in uh, Nicaragua, Ethiopia, and Uganda. And after that, we'll design and implement country-specific interventions. But as I said before, we have to look at which partner is strong in what area and weak in what area, and then they'll drill on that to develop interventions to enhance their capacities. And after that, we'll be measuring the outcomes or the impacts of these interventions, and we are, that's where our research component will come in. And uh, we have uh, materials in place that uh, you can refer to if at all you're interested in this methodology. And uh, I had more members on this slide, but of course we acknowledge partners that we work with. We have staff from Mikada, Siat, who helped us implement this assessment. But we also have colleagues who left Ileri who had actively in, engaged in this entire process right from the beginning. People like Diana, I think she started this. We had uh, research technicians who left Millicent and Violet, and this really helped us a lot in getting this work done.